Okay, here we are looking at Google Apps as conduits for collaboration and also concept building for online learning. My name is Kathleen Gradle. I am from Fredonia, New York. And yes, it is from New York, so I'm going to try to not talk too fast today as we move through these things. We have about an hour together. Normally I do this in an interactive style. So today I'm going to try, since we've pre-recorded this, to tour you through some course uses of Google Apps and also consider some startup and build out suggestions for yourself. So as we go along, I will be trying to make those recommendations to you. These recommendations come largely from questions that have been asked when I've done face-to-face -face and hands-on sessions as well as virtual sessions. So let me give you a little bit of context here. This is a very busy slide. I do not expect you to read it. However, I, I am going to point out that you have access to these slides and to the whole presentation as well as the links after the session. So I wanted to give you a little context. SUNY Fredonia is part of the New York system, which very much parallels the California system. Here in New York, we are considered a comprehensive college, which means that we are primarily a four-year university but not an R1 or research institution. Many of our students transfer in from four-year undergrad programs in community colleges. And we have some graduate students, but a very limited graduate program, pretty much all education majors. They have to come back to complete their master's degree in order to become professionally certified in education. The courses that I'm showcasing today are undergrad courses, and they are make up a large part of what I normally teach. My course load is normally three to four courses, uh, three courses in the spring, four courses in the three courses in the fall, four courses in the spring, so three four load. For example, this spring I taught four courses, three of them online and one face to face. Typically, half of my courses are ed psych, educational psychology, and the other half are the literacy technology courses that are designed for pre-service teachers. I've been teaching online for about four years. Most of my students have been enrolled in the educational psychology courses that I teach. It is required for education undergrads as well as for people who are pursuing alternate routes to teaching certification. Last year I began teaching a second online course, which is the literacy technology course that you will see some of today. As part of my work in the At One online teaching certification program in California, I moved one of my online courses to a totally Google Sites delivery platform outside of ANGEL, which is our learning management system. At the same time, not from my practicum at At One, but at the same time, I also moved my Ed Site course out of ANGEL into a Google Sites platform. I'm telling you this because that pivot about a year ago really pushed me to become even more conscious of the power of various Google Apps working together to help my students both master the content that I'm focused on and also become much more interactive in the online environment. So here are my big ideas as we jump into this. First of all, Google Apps have helped me flip my face-to-face -to -face courses to totally streamline both tool use and communication in face-to-face -face and in online courses. The other big idea is this, based on data that I have collected from students at the beginning of my courses, the only students with prior Google Apps experience have tended to be those who have taken another course from me. And the other big idea is this, I'm sure that you have experienced this as you have adopted new technology. Technologies, students' initial predispositions 
generally are not very positive or upbeat about being thrust into the Google Apps environment initially. Without prior experience or an across-the-board adoption of new tools, they look, they look at me virtually and say, are you crazy or what planet are you from? So they are very unsure of themselves initially, as most of us are when we are adopting a new technology. That's the bad news. The good news is for the majority of students, this changes dramatically by the end of the course. So I put on the slide, woohoo. Yes, um, so they build their competence and their confidence as they move through the course in using kind of scaffolded experiences with, with Google Apps. And the other background piece is last January our campus converted to using Google Apps. We are all on the Google on Gmail and Google Sites, Docs, um, Blogger, the core the core parts of Google Apps are available to all instructors and all and all students to use. Normally I would do a live poll here, so I want you to do a mental one. Where are you with Google Apps right now? Which of the things below and more than one can apply? Which things apply to you right now? A is I use Google Apps for my own productivity. So you might use Google Docs to work on articles with a colleague or to share syllabi with, with colleagues. B is I use Google Apps to enhance students' access to materials. So for example, you might put documents into Google Docs to share with your students, but not necessarily to have them interact with. C is I ask students to use Google Apps to collaborate. So for example, you might create um, a document and ask them to team together to complete it. D is I ask students to produce materials in Google Apps. So this is the full Monty. This is asking students to, to use some of the Google Apps tools to actually show what they know or understand, either independently or, or together. And E is I'm a Google Apps newbie, but I'm considering options. So think about where you are on that. I'm hoping that by the end of, the, of this little tour, you might be, if you're at A or E, you might be thinking about using B, C, or D, meaning putting Google apps into the hands of students to promote their, both their learning and their, and their productivity. So I mentioned a, a few minutes ago that you will have access to the files that we're going to be looking at as we, as we move through this tour. And this is the URL. It's a short version of a much longer version of a Google Doc. So it would be HTTP forward slash colon forward slash forward slash tinyurl.com forward slash kg hyphen OTC12. So go ahead and uh, put that into your browser if you want to be doing, taking a look at these things as we move along. I'm going to be flipping back and forth, not too often, but about three times during the course of this hour to some whiteboard slides that help keep us focused, and then I'll be flipping to the links that are on that Google Doc that I just shared with you. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is something that is, I think, kind of familiar to most of us. We're all in the word processing mode, or we got in it many years ago. And I'm going to be featuring four kind of versions of using the word-ish face of Google Docs, meaning the, the word processing side of Google Docs. We're going to be looking at collaborative products that students work on together some features of Google Docs that help students do joint thinking, some features that help keep students focused on the things that you think are most essential to learning something, and on my kind of personal favorite, housekeeping, how Google Docs can help us with housekeeping. So now I'm going to go into um, application sharing, and the first thing that I'm going to do is actually take us to um, 
the Google Doc that I just mentioned. So if you have put that URL into your browser, you'll see, by the way, that you're going to a much longer URL, which is up here. But I shrunk it in that wonderful tool called TinyURL. And at the very top of this document, you'll see that um, the link to the to the slideshow, the presentation that, that we're using as kind of our focus is here. So in part one, we're going to be taking a look at, at those couple of variations of how docs can serve kind of as a, a focusing point using something that we're all pretty familiar with, which is word processing. So the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at a study guide that I had my students do um, using Google Docs. And if you click to it, or if you just take a look at what I have up here on the screen, you'll see that um, this is just looks like a plain old document. It is. And it's filled with little tables. So what I did is create for each of the chapters in one of my course textbooks a shell. And the shell is made up of several different chunks or, or sections. That um, format gave students an opportunity to become experts. That's what that's what I what we call ourselves when we focus our efforts on something experts. So I created teams, and I have to admit, I put some people that based on prior work in the course, I knew were overachievers and some that were less overachievers into heterogeneous teams. And then I asked them to sign up for different pages, chunks of pages in the text. So that's what you're seeing here. And then using, um, and this was empty when they first came to it except for the headings and the, and the, the tables, I asked them to generate based on their reading of the text, the key ideas that they got from the chapter. So the person in charge of pages 8 to 11 added her information, and I'm going to just skim down. And then you'll see that I chunked it out so that there would be no issue about where students needed to put their information. I think this is one of the uh, necessary things that you get into when you think about using a virtual collaborative document is you need to help students know where to go just like when you're organizing them in cooperative groups in face-to-face -face classes. You say please you know, number off and get in desks and move to this corner or that corner of the room. So that's essentially what this document does is it's created these chunks and again we're selling key ideas. So I've chunked it out for them. They just need to plug their information and their thinking into this document. The next part is vocabulary terms. So I asked them to identify vocabulary that was essential to understanding their chapter. The idea was that other students could come to this and use this material later to build some pretty big assignments that we did later in the course. So I'm skimming through. And you can see that students really did an excellent job, even without reading it. They wrote an awful lot of stuff. This is pretty exciting. Um, it's actually quality work. The next thing that I asked students to do was add a series of value-added resources. And this is um, where our future teachers really get into it. So I asked them to identify lesson plans related to their, their topic. I asked them to find some teaching resources and to find some video that would show this kind of teaching going on. So they had to use their favorite tool, Google Search Engine. I'm sure they did to get this information. And then at the very end, I asked them to identify um, hopefully objective questions about their content so that we could later on build it into a little um, quiz for our colleagues. So this is what we call a study guide. and People got individually graded on their chunks, but together, even without dividing up the workload, etc., they were able to collaborate on a document with very little learning curve 
to produce something that actually presents as a very intact document. Now it's my job to make sure that the stuff makes sense, of course, um, and also uh, not only made sense but was their own work and was, was usable by others. So the ingredients would be a, a document that is shared and that the way it there's two sharing features. One is to make sure that the people have the link to it, and the other is to make sure that it is shared, and I'm clicking on the share button up here, to the people who needed to work on it. Now I have made a copy of this for you all, so I'm, right now it's only viewable by you all, but normally the people who are interacting with it would have the opportunity to edit it. So that's one example of using a collaborative product. Um, I want to. I'm going to show you another um, version of a collaborative document. Let's see if I can click to the right. Yeah. Um, let me close that for a second. Um, I want to show you another document. That and here it comes now works the same way, different content, and I'm actually showing you a live document that students worked on because I want to show you one of the powerful features of Google Docs that doesn't come through when you make a copy of it. So this same group of students needed to develop in another unit of study. This happens sometimes. Sometimes, like I say, you have to whack Google a little bit to make sure that we're all on the same page. So students had to study about plagiarism, and then they had to identify, locate some tools and resources that they could use to teach their own students in their certification area how to be non-plagiarizers. So you can see students filling in this this table with information. And some areas have yellow highlighting. It's not actually highlighting because if you take a look at the comments, you will see that the students have used the commenting feature in Google Docs to comment on each other's contributions. They didn't do it um, without a prompt. Yes, this was part of the assignment. What I asked students to do was explore the resources that each of them had generated and then make a constructive comment about or two about that student's work. This is not live chat. This is asynchronous chat, if you will, and it's focused right in the document. So even though I have a blog that students in this course blog on, this allows them the opportunity to climb into and stay focused on the content of the document with the people who have the rights to comment and and engage in some conversation that does not need to be synchronous. I have found this to be such a powerful tool not just for me to use when I'm giving feedback to students in Google Docs work that they do, but also for co for colleagues to learn that absolutely essential idea of how do I effectively communicate online in a safe environment, but on content, not just kind of doing fluff commenting. So um, this is a stepping stone to later in the course when we do other things with commenting, which is much uh, more heavy duty. But it's a very nice feature of being able to go into a document and not change it. Don't change the intent or the wording that anyone has put into it, but to make comments on it and give the author the opportunity to go ahead and make changes if she or he wishes. So that is another view of um, of collaborative or joint thinking that um, that I've used. I also wanted to point out that yes, we did use a, and now I'm down on that third link. Um, on your on your link file, um, as you can see, I love tables, but this is an example of 
um, setting up a, a framework to encourage collaboration again, but um, in, in kind of a different way. So here I used a model of website um, critiquing, the real model that Alan November um, initiated, and set up a document that has four sections, an R, an E, an A, and an L section, and then asked team members to come in and sign up on this um, document and then take responsibility for that chunk of it. So if they were the R, they only did the R part. If they were the E, they only did the E part. However, what's different here is this is a, a master document. So students are directed to come in, go in, make a copy of this. Please don't type into this document. And begin to learn to use file naming and file sharing conventions. So now they have their own version. And I actually asked the R person to become the team leader and do this. They have to go in and, and rename the file. And we'll just call it Team 1. And then share it with the members of their team. Because right now the document is private to just me, the owner. So in the first trimester of the course, students learn to make copies and share with the people that they want to share with in order to then go ahead and complete this format. In this case, what they're doing is they're, they're reviewing using some, hopefully some learning that they've already gotten under their belt. They're reviewing a um, hoax or a, um, some kind of a, an, an iffy website and then making judgments about it as they, as they fill out this format. So again, I encourage them to use commenting because at a certain point in time after they've completed their work, I ask them to go in and um, again, using job descriptions, the R person looks at the E person's input and makes comments. The E person looks at the A person. So um, using job description based interactions, I ask them to use this format to then go ahead and comment on each other's work so that they can make tweaks before it gets finalized. So that's an example of using a shared doc um, and keeping a common focus using the tools. We're going to skip over um, one of the links I have for you because I'm checking the time and I'm needing to move along. But the next document is called Rules and Procedures Note Taker takes the idea of using a doc and not using it collaboratively, but using some of the ideas that we've already um, explored. Again, this is a master, so I'm going to ask students to make a copy. And this is exactly what I have them do. I have little screencasts that I've built that model for them. Um, I send them right to Google's directions or tutorials that other people have already done on YouTube. And what I ask them to do is I ask them to use the module materials and use this as a note taker. So instead of saying, just please take notes, early in the course I'm asking them to find out certain things. This is in the EdSight course. And use their tools efficiently. So they're use, what they're doing is they're looking at an enhanced podcast that I've made. And they're also looking at a couple of links to materials that other people have developed at the IRIS website. And they're, they're exploring the difference for between rules and procedures in classrooms. And all I've done is, you know, this is a worksheet. All this is is a worksheet. So it's a note taker that I expect students to complete. And it helps keep them focused on the things that I think are going to be essential for them to understand the materials that they're using. So all it is is a focusing agent. And they're doing it on, the, on their own. So one of the things that I ask them to do is, Make sure, since this is now going to be part of the record of your work, to follow file naming conventions that I've set up for the course. So I ask them to always name something with their last name. That just makes it easier for me to search for in um, my own Google Docs library. So we've taken a look at, at, at 
some of those examples. And what I wanted to do now was show you a real template. For those of you who have, um, so I'm going to go back to the rules and procedures note taker, and I'm going to go back, go to my Google Docs library, which has a lot of stuff in it, and I am going to show you how if you have set a real template to either the public templates gallery in Google, in Google or the template gallery in your own Google Apps environment. Remember, we have our own domain. So at Fredonia's Google, Google Apps environment, um, we have the opportunity to put SUNY Fredonia templates up. There are public templates. Those are the ones that anyone in the world can put up to Google. These are the ones that um, folks have put up here at SUNY. And you can see that there are actually very few. As I said, we don't have um, a lot of people who are actively using Google Apps on our campus. Um, several of them are mine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that I've asked students to go to the learning log form and use this template. You can see that the operation is a little different than when the student has to go to File, Make a Copy. And what happens here is it automatically makes an individual copy of the form that is private to that individual. This actually isn't a course that I teach. It's one that I have helped um, one of my colleagues set up for um, using Google Docs. But I'm going to follow the file naming conventions, and now it's mine. So again, it's just a little table that I'm going to fill in, add the information. And what Dr. Majira has asked is she uses a 10-point rating scale. She just puts the rubric on the top. It, uh, she has the, what the point spread means elsewhere. And that way she can just bold and underline what the score is, and automatically, as long as the student has shared it to her, and I'm going to pretend that we're sharing it to one of my alter egos, just so you can see how that works. Um, now both people can interact with this document. See the two people? No, those are both me, but I'm just illustrating for your sake. Both the student and the professor can interact, and there is no emailing forms. There is no putting it into drop boxes, etc. And the feedback and the changes are there right away. So this is actually using a true template in Google's frame, frame of reference. So what I'm going to do now is take us, um, whoa, uh, take us out of file sharing for a second and bring us back. I think you'll see that we took a look at a bunch of collaborative products, but also some that had a special intention of doing some joint thinking, some that were really trying to get focused on content and using the, the technology itself. And um, I forgot to show you housekeeping, so I'm going to go back and show you that in, uh, in just a second. But before I do that, what I want to do is wrap up just a little bit of some of the ideas here be, be, behind using the wordish face of docs. I think first of all, because we and students are pretty comfortable with word processing, it's an easy starting point. Um, editing is very much like using an early version of Word, like the 2003 version. So there's not a lot of bells and whistles, and they're pretty familiar. I think the other feature of and the strength of using the Word side of Docs is that it reinforces early on some easy ways of doing collaboration. For example, when we assign jobs in a template, people can do their fair share and then get um, a finished product without having to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I also think that the communication conventions and the file naming conventions that sometimes are difficult to teach. We teach early on using docs, and we do it over and over and over again. Um, 
I think it's pretty evident that that one of the things that any technology needs to do for us is complement the pedagogy and not supplant it. So in that um, very first file that we looked at, which was that study guide, I needed to know where I wanted to be at the end, and I wanted to know how that document could be used later. I'm not saying that every single document that you're going to produce is going to be used again for other than study, review, that kind of thing, but some of them will be. So I think that knowing where you want to go and where you want the students to go in using the finished product is going to be a very helpful way to design it at the front end. Um, for example, in that study guide, students are later writing a digital story and they come back to the study guide in order to get refreshed on vocabulary building, on comprehension, um, those kinds of things. And they have a kind of a shortcut, media-filled um, opportunity to do it with the book and outside the book. And then the other thing that I think is really a, uh, an essential strength of, of docs is there are some really cool features. For example, I can translate any document into any number of languages. It isn't always the absolute best, but it is a good starting point. I can save every document, download it as a PDF. With the PDF, I know I can do a bunch of other things. And as I mentioned, commenting is a very um, powerful tool, I think, in Google Docs. So before we move into um, going back to housekeeping, uh, I'm going to go and talk a little bit about the present the presentation phase of Docs. This is the PowerPoint side of Docs. So for you and for students, it may also be a comfortable starting point. So we're going to take a look at a, comp a couple of collaborative products, a way of using um, the presentation side of Docs as a way to essentially um, give students choices on alternative ways of showing what they know. Maybe thinking about it as a climate tool and also as a way of, I call them staging zones. So let's go back and I want to show you a, just really quickly uh, what I forgot to show you before about housekeeping. I don't like to clean windows and I am not necessarily a great housekeeper. So I'm just closing a couple of windows here just to show you that I can do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so here is my um, Google Docs library in my Fredonia domain. And although I have a lot of individual files, I also have something called collections. So in Google, we can create um, would-be folders. What's great is I don't have to put things into folders. I just tag them, and, I, and they become part of that folder. So let me open up one of my at Psych courses for the semester, uh, collections for the semester. And I'm going to open up um, Module 4. These are all the files that were submitted to me or shared with me in, um, for Module 4 by my one section. So every student has to submit a rubric, and they also, also have to submit one or two other files. And the way they do it is just by hitting that sharing button and sharing it with me. That auto means that I automatically have access to it. Now they can determine what level of access I have. I, all, I usually ask them to share with at least commenting rights. Um, so for example, let's look at Angie's rubric. So I ask them to rate themselves on, on our core course rubric. I have immediate access to it and then I can either create a rubric of a parallel rubric or I can edit this this rubric that um, the student has submitted. Similarly, following the module guidance, I ask students to create little headings that they use to summarize information and then put the information into the Google Doc and share it with me. So I'm skimming through Kim's, whoa, and these were some optional notes that she put in um, about a bunch of materials that we looked at on positive behavioral supports. Um, what is so cool is because they're working in a 
virtual environment, they can embed things that they know they'll be able to use later, for example, embedded links, as well as things that I require that they do. So this gives me ready access to to both their notes and their thinking. So for example, this is a an application that they needed to do. I call it pick your poison. Um, they need to respond to the situation, answer it, um, and I can go in and make comments to it. Thanks for doing these. Um, or I can and or I can add comments to my rubric for the student. So um, under housekeeping, here's my big idea. There is no exchange of paper, obviously. There's no Dropboxes. There's no emailing. And we both have access to the thing at the very same time. Collections help me, but they're not necessary. Um, so uh, that's another, another little housekeeping housekeepy thing. Um, so now what we're going to do is take a look at on your little link sheet, you'll see that I have a, a different version of a, of a study guide. This is actually for the very same book, um, but I asked students to instead think about using, if they wished, a PowerPoint-ish equivalent. And this was the chapter on vocabulary. So when this gets started, um, it looks pretty much like a SlideShare or some other virtual um, platform where you can post a PowerPoint. And I'm just going to click through because I know you don't want to read this. Um, and what what they had to do was I gave them four or five different jobs. They had to determine uh, who was going to do what job and then input the information using using the slides. Why is this different than PowerPoint? Because four people can work on it synchronously and or asynchronously. And they can share it to anyone with the power of a hyperlink. So a different um, slant on taking information and collapsing it, you know, synthesizing it, that kind of thing, using presentation. Um, this was a Another variation of the very same idea, I had students actually try to find some information on using some of the other Google stuff and create little tutorials for their colleagues. So this is a little tutorial on using Google Advanced Search to find um, websites that were um, a little easier to read for students who had lower reading skills. So what they did is put a little tutorial together for their colleagues. Usually my gimme is, you know, if you do it for them, um, they'll do it for you. Um, again, using Google presentation, this is, um, and some of the ed psych units, there's a lot of terminology. So I asked students to create little vocabulary banks for themselves. And this student cho chose to use um, the presentation arm of Google Docs. And the idea is to paraphrase the term and use a book citation so that you can go back and get to the information when you need to. She preferred to do this because when she was studying, this served more, could serve more as a flashcard type of venue so that she could look at the word and say, um, gosh, do I remember what you know this means? And if if I do, let me check. And if I don't, hmm, I know where to go back in the book and get to it. So um, this was an alternate opportunity for her to choose the format that that worked best for her. Um, climate. This was this is kind of fun. I do it in class. I have hat day and um, you know different kinds of special I'm going, what am I gonna um uh, special events. You know, we do Mardi Gras, we do other other things for extra credit points. And what I'm doing is I just want to get to this demo um for you. Um 
this one um, is for Halloween. And in our area here in Western New York, Halloween is a, a big thing. So in order to help students get acquainted with each other and have a little bit of fun, this is an optional activity. They could plug a picture of something that they thought of for Halloween <laughs> into this. These are two of my sets of twins, not my mine, but my grandchildren. And um, this served two purposes for me. Number one is it gave them kind of a chance to play around. But the other thing is it gave me a baseline on how smart they were about using images that they were um, permitted to use. And I have to say they weren't very good at it, so it gave me a really good baseline for when we did some other work. So um, this was it's an easy format to get students to share on without a whole lot of constructing of rules and regulations and directions. So it was just kind of fun. And again, it was an optional thing for them to do. Um, back to our link, our link list. There's one other thing that um, I've used um, presentation for, and I'm calling it staging zones. So in staging zones, the idea is we're using it to actually um, create it in docs. In, in Docs and then do something else with it. So I'm going to just bring this over because this is a demo piece for you. I'm skipping over the link that you do have. One of the links will take you right to a set of QR codes. This one is um, the preview for a digital story. So I ask students to pick a critter and create a story. They did it in Docs. They did not do it on the presentation. They then pasted the elements of the story into the quote pages in the presentation. And then they added images. This was done asynchronously and it was done by pairs of two following some guidance that they had they had determined between the two of them who was going to focus on which images, who was going to do the the, the different jobs. Um, the idea is that they could do it together and not email each other the stuff. They could also engage in commenting if they wanted to, which would give context to what it was that they were talking about. So they could go in and um, insert a comment saying, are you sure we can use this? And then that could be responded to by the teammate. So it, it gives them a, a staging area. They then downloaded this and could then move it into a variety of different platforms. One that they used was to move it into VoiceThread so that they could provide voice over for each of the read each of the pages. Um, another was one of the EPUB formats issue so that it could become a page flippable document just by downloading it and uploading it as a PDF. And then they also uploaded it to Animoto to make it into a music based kind of um, um, musical digital story, which is kind of cool. So um, the idea of using it as, as a staging zone is very different than you know working on it as a finished product. And I think that that's one of the advantages of, advantages, advantages of docs. It can take on many different faces. So let's take us back and see where we are. Okay, we reviewed collaborative products. We looked at choosing presentation as a different mode. And um, I'll just use this as a little summary here. I think that, again, the presentation side familiar, right? My students actually love PowerPoint. I'm not sure why. Um, sometimes it takes extra orchestration. So sometimes you need to say, line up 
the roster, 1 through 30, hopefully not 30, but 1 through 20. And if, if you're number 1, you're slide 1. If you're number 2, you're slide 2. So it may take some extra organization. Again, easy collaboration because it sits in the clouds and has the potential for asynchronous work. And commenting is there so that we can ha don't have to leave the environment in order to add some extra information as we're working on things together. And then as I mentioned, very easy to transfer to alternate formats. So now we're going to take a really quick view of Google Forms. And Lots of things you can do with Google Forms. It's the front end of a spreadsheet in Google Docs, which is really cool. So um, I'm going to flip us back over to application sharing and see if we can just look at a couple of examples. There are more on your on your cheat sheet here on your on your cookie um, that you may want to spend time on later. If you are like me, you're constantly guessing, did I did I project right on how much time I expected this task or this activity or this reading to take? So I frequently do little time readings with my students. Um, and so I'm I really am bargaining that they should be spending about seven hours a week on my on my work. I'm also many times along the way trying to encourage them to engage in things that are, I think are pretty effective online learning behaviors. For example, using a study area with not too many distractions or making study dates with myself that correspond to the work schedule, those kinds of things. So I'm using this for a couple of different reasons. One is to get some feedback from them, but also to reinforce that they're either about where their colleagues are on time expenditure um, or not, and that they are doing or not doing the kinds of things that I'm recommending that they do to stay with it in the course. So one of the features in Google Forms is not just to create the little survey, but to do on-the-fly feedback. And as you can tell, I just input it into a form that had some prior responses. This would give the student the opportunity to see about where she or he just rated, um, did the ratings in comparison to everyone else who had responded at that point in time. So you can see that, gosh, most people are between seven and eight hours. So about seven, seven and a half hours would be about right on the money. So, so yes, formative input, but also a way to tickle, um, tickle the student. Um, here's another um, version and a, a, a drawback of Google Forms. Easy peasy to make, nice clean format. You can have different themes. You could the last one you saw the clock theme. Um, so this is before we jump into learning about rules and procedures in classrooms. And I'm just arbitrarily um, filling this in. Okay. And I ask students for their name. You can choose um, to have a required response or not, just like in SurveyMonkey or anything else. And in this case, I'm not giving the students a chance to see what the other people did because I didn't even tell you. But at the very top of the form, it says, plunge into the module. This is designed to prime the pump. Oh, about answers? We'll figure them out together on our blog as we move along in the module. So what I'm doing is I'm saying you're not going to get the answers right away. Google Forms, in order to self-correct or check to see whether an answer is correct or not, it takes some extra legwork behind the form in the spreadsheet in order to do it. And we don't have time to do that today, but there are plenty of demos online that, that um, help you to do that. Um, and let's see. Um, and because there are not ready-made ways for students to immediately get feedback on how they did on a quiz or self-check, this is another self-check. This is on Universal Design for Learning and one of the platforms that we use in, in one of my courses. I'm, I'm pretending that I'm filling out all the things. Um, 
oh, and it wants me to fill out even my name, so I'm just going to ignore that. So what I've done um, in this case is directed students after they take that check to come to another Google Doc, not a form, and get feedback on it. And so those were the questions I just answered. It tells me what the correct answer is. It gives the rationale for it. And in some cases, it provides a link to the thing that I want them to go to for extra help. So I've kind of jury-rigged the um, process to provide some some additional flexibility using Google Apps, but but um, capitalizing on both Google Forms and Google Apps together. And it is so easy that your students can actually do it themselves. So this is the proof of the pudding. Remember, uh, probably about 20 minutes ago, we saw the presentation tutorial on Google Advanced Search. Well, those same students also created a little quiz for their colleagues using Google Forms to see if when they did the tutorial, did they get it. So, um, and you can see there's some uh, grammar and whatever in here, un unfettered um, enthusiasm here. So this is a Google Form that students have, have developed in order to um, both show that they know how to use the tool, but also construct some reasonable questions, etc. Um, course, so then we have, um, what I'm going to do is quickly flip back to our framework here. We saw Google Forms, and I know you're getting tired of this, but pretty easy. As you can see, we can interface Google uh, Forms with Google Docs, with other Google Apps. And there are some features, though, that are maybe not as positive, some drawbacks. So not immediately self-checking for correct and incorrect objective responses. Also, even though um, people can collaborate on building a Google Form, they can share to each other, do kind of what we did in the other formats, it tends to be clunkier. You have to save, you have to um, um, refresh often, which is much less true of the other apps that I just showed you. So we looked at all those things, and now we're going to do a quick, couple of quick teasers. These are just a couple of demos. Google Sites is the, the web building application. And I did mention in the blurb advertising this session that we were going to talk about Coursey portfolios. Clearly, I'm going to go from the bottom up. Um, clearly, we can, can do full course delivery using a Google site. And I've done that with, with my two online courses now. We can also take certain chunks that we want to do special training on and build separate little websites that interface really easily just by the click of a link. Um, I'm probably not going to get into this example here, students building teaching materials, but I do want to spend just a few minutes talking with you about the use of course ePortfolios. By the way, um, if you're interested in spending some time on the, those other three app applications, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send you some examples. Um, but we're back into application sharing. And what I want to do is show you uh, one of my sophomores. Um, I'm clicking to a, a separate little document here. It is not a Google Doc. Um, so I'm taking you to, with permission, a sophomore's ePortfolio that you build in Google Sites. So the hardest decision is usually what theme should I use? And this is the notebook theme. Um, what students do as they complete assignments in the course is they create an artifact or a page for them in their ePortfolio. So I'm going to click on the Wordle one just as an example because we're really honing in on time here. And this 
and I'm going to decode this page for you. So what Chelsea did was do the assignment, which was to build a Wordle and put it into a Google Doc. Answer some questions about it, and that's what you're seeing here. Welcome to my first Wordle. And she tells us what tool she used, what she practiced. These are the reflection questions that I asked them to complete. She took the Google Doc and she embedded it in this page. So she has a scrollable document, just one of many ways to use Google Sites to um, to interface with with Google Docs. At the end of the course, I asked her and her colleagues to organize their artifacts based on the ISTE standards. So it took moving the pages to get them nested under here. Initially, they're just listed on the left. I grade much of their work right in the ePortfolio, so I get lots of opportunity to, to touch their, their ePortfolios and interact with them. Um, and while we're here, though, I would like to um, amplify two other things before we close out. These are, I have them under a plug, a plug for drawings and a plug for custom search engines. So you have links to both of these. Notice much of this can be done without having a website set up using Google Sites. A Google Drawing is just another Google Doc. So I had students um, do plot, plot summaries using Google Drawings where they meshed words with some drawings. They could have used um, PowerPoint. They could have used lots of other things. But this interface is so nicely with Google Docs, and they're right in a Google Doc environment. So um, that's one little infomercial, a little plug for your students who can show better than tell. And the other thing, it's not exactly a Google app, it's a Google tool, but you know that every website that we're on pretty much has a built-in search engine. Most of us are using, or most of the platforms are using custom Google search engines. So this is a, a little worksheet that I wanted students to complete on Bloom's Taxonomy. I asked them to, I'll just skim down to the worksheet part real quick, fill in the answers to these questions. But instead of going off on their merry way to um, find whatever they may want to find, I created a custom search engine with just the websites that I wanted them to use. And there it is. I also have keywords that I want them to use to find things. So if I wanted to search for, say, the new Bloom's Taxonomy, I'm going to get what looks like a normal Google search with the ads on the top and the right, unless I change that. And then I'm going to get results only from the websites that I have selected. So I actually have students do this for lots of reasons. One is to scaffold them, to um, convince them about using good sites, and also to, um, to go ahead and kind of um, think about ways that they can do it in their own classrooms. That's always my, my subliminal message. So I wanted to just highlight a couple of things here. One is um, on the little plug I just gave you for custom search engine and for and for the um, for the drawing. These provide, I think, some nice options and scaffolds for students at different points in your course, as well as um, for different students. Now I'm going to try to wrap up really quickly. I have this Lego picture here because I think, if anything. Um, the Google Apps illustrate ways that we can build slowly and methodically and systematically and also sometimes really experiment. So my suggestions, take one step at a time. Take one assignment that you think could live virtually in a Google App and convert it. Don't add um, another assignment. 
convert an assignment. So if you're going to add something, you're going to have to take something away. And I think that we always have that balance of do I want to add? Yes, well then I'm going to need to you know, do the, the balancing act as well. Um, it's very easy to merge Google Apps within existing platforms and learning management systems. All it is is embedding a link to take the student from X to Y. So from your learning management system to a Google Doc as an example. Mix and match is another idea. You could see that I mixed and matched by by taking um, the Google kind of quiz on UDL and matching it to answers that were in Google Docs. So there, it all depends on what you want to do. And also, I can't say this enough, so much is out there that people have built, both examples, templates, and also tutorials. So you don't have to create everything from scratch. Trust me. You may want to tailor it, but you don't have to create it all from scratch. And finally, I know there's no time for questions, and I won't be around for the questions either. I'll be attending sessions. Um, thank you very much for being here, and I really appreciate your attention.